Welcome to this Rayworth's Harrogate Literature Festival event. It's part of the Harrogate International Festivals. And we're delighted and very grateful that once again, Rayworth's LLP Solicitors, a local firm in Harrogate, is sponsoring the festival. You can contribute to the cause too. You can donate by going to the website. As you know, tickets for this and the other events are free. My name is Matt Stadlin. I'm a presenter, I'm a producer, I'm a writer, I'm basically a, a broadcaster. And I'm totally delighted to introduce to you the most fantastic person, Arianna Neumann. And she's written the most wonderful book. It really is a, a beautiful read. And it's incredibly moving as well. I commend it to you. It's called When Time Stopped, a memoir of my father's war and what remains. Ariana, it's so lovely to have you with us. Uh, it's lovely to be here, Matt. I, the only thing I can think that would be better would be to be in Harrogate. Uh, is that how you say it? Har I, I'm Venezuelan, so Harrogate, I suppose is how you say it. Um, and, and have a cake at Betty's Tea Shop, which yes. is pretty, it's absolutely <laughs> delicious. So. I would so love to be having a cake at Betty's Tea Shop. Not right now, because I want to talk to you, but afterwards. Exactly, exactly. Anyways, it's great. It's great to talk to you virtually as well. But then the advantage of this is we get little windows into each other's homes, I suppose. I know I can see what kind of lights you like. It's really interesting. You can see my really old fashioned ones <laughs> by oh, the bookshelf. One or two of the lights were here when I bought the place. So <laughs> I don't know quite what that says about me. Probably that I'm lazy, but I think I quite like them. Before we start, given that you have written a book that in many ways would not have happened, might never have happened, had you not stumbled across this treasure box of extraordinary documents in your parents' home back in, in Venezuela when you were a little girl. I thought I would introduce to you and to the Harrogate audience this, which is a, a soldier. I don't know whether it's made of China or quite what it's made of, but I think it's probably my most prized possession. And it is, was given to me by my grandfather in his will, I think, when he died in 1988 and I, I, I just treasure it I, partly because it's from him partly because it's beautiful partly because I somehow want to have a, a physical memento or connection to the past and the past is tremendously important and a lot of us I think now because we're in the pandemic are looking backwards as well as forwards with with some degree of anxiety many of us but we're looking backwards because it's nostalgic. It's like a sort of a, a different world. And so we're reading your book about the past that was written in the past pre-pandemic. There are so many different layers. And before I let you get a word in edgeways, and I will, sh I will shut up soon, is Jonathan Miller. So Jonathan Miller once said to me when I was doing an interview with him, that plays and, and works of art and literature, and I hope I'm not misrepresenting what he said, have an afterlife. So the, a play that was written on the eve of the First World War is read by us or, or watched by us after the end of the First World War through very different eyes to the eyes of the author or the playwright who wrote it because of what has happened, what had happened since, all those lives lost in the First World War. So how and when we, we read or, or watch a piece of art gives a very different context to it, I think. And so we read your book about the Second World War, essentially, written before the pandemic, but now with sort of post-pandemic or during pandemic eyes and sensitivities. Absolutely. I mean, there's all these res resonances that, you know, I obviously couldn't have imagined that people were going, time was going to stop in many ways when people were going to be reading this. Um, and I think it, um, I mean, I think the book is, becomes something completely different perhaps than what I intended it to be to some people because they're reading it and they feel like they're confined. They feel like time has stopped, like they have no control over their lives, that they're isolated from, from those that they love. Um, so hopefully then they can, I don't know, they can look at how my, I mean, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but maybe they can, they'll look at what my grandparents said about being confined in Theresienstadt and, and take some inspiration from that and I, you know, which is completely different than I think the reading would be completely different than someone that read it in February when it first came out right before the lockdown. So you're absolutely right. Books acquire a life of their own and, and art acquires, not that my book is art, but art acquires a life of its own when it's put out there in the world, depending on who interacts with it and what they're thinking and doing 
at that time in their lives, right? Well, we'll get to Otto and Ella's experiences. And there are so many different threads to the story that you bring together wonderfully. But I, I, I want to just take a, a step back, having hijacked the beginning of this conversation, by just asking you simply why you chose to write the book and, and how, how, how long in the deciding to write the book were you? So the book happened by accident, really. Um, it, it was never meant to be a book. It didn't start off its journey as a book. Um, it started as a, you know, it was started as a detective story. I want, I always wanted to be a detective and I did always want to be a writer, but I didn't think my writing would be good enough. And I thought my detective work was actually pretty good. Um, and I wanted to solve the mystery of my father, um, who was a very enigmatic man and, and, um, and uh, who always, it was something hidden and I knew it as a, as a child. So it started as a personal journey. I wanted to go back and sort of figure out where I came from uh, really because it, the past was never spoken about as I was growing up. And, and whenever I asked, had asked any questions of my father's life before Venezuela, um, I, they were all met with a wall of silence. So all I knew really was that he had emigrated in 1949 from Prague with his brother and he had escaped a broken Europe um, and, and that was it. So it was really a journey to solve that mystery. It, I was egged on by the fact that after he died, he left me this remarkable box that you talked about, which I had found as a child detective in Venezuela, which had an ID card with a photograph of my father, um, which wasn't from Prague, which were, which were you know, he was from, but it was, it said Berlin. And more importantly, it was made out in someone else's name. So I had always wanted to solve that mystery. And he left me the box after he died. I thought there was permission to solve it. So it didn't start off as a book and he died in 2001. I didn't quite get around to doing all the research and, and feeling bold enough to really start asking questions until about 2008 or nine. And then in 2011, this other remarkable box made its way to me. And it was a box of letters from my grandparents who were interned in the camp of Theresienstadt. Um, so I was curious because I didn't, nothing was ever said to me about them. I had no idea who they were, what they were like. Um, and all I really knew about them is that they, I mean, there was only one picture in my house when I was growing up. It was a picture of these two people who looked really, really sad, which is unusual for photos, right? I mean, we keep photos of people looking happy, not people looking miserable. Um, so that's all I knew. So it was, a, it was a sort of journey where I had the letters translated. It was a journey to get to know them um, and really find out where, you know, where, where I was from and what, what I was made, uh, made up of. I mean, I knew my mother's family really well um, and you know, her ancestors and they, everyone spoke about it very freely, but I knew nothing of my father's. And as I had children, I, that becomes more important. I think, you know, you sort of, your twenties, teens, you don't really give a hoot where you come from and you just want to separate yourself, right? From, from your parents and those that came before. In your twenties, I think you're sort of doing the same thing and finding out who you are. In your thirties, you start maybe looking back and, um, and that's sort of when I felt a little bolder and, and that was it. So it was until 2017 when I was telling the story to someone at a dinner party, because by then I was really just living and breathing, not only the story of my grandparents, but the story of my father's amazing survival during the war. And someone said it has to be a book. And then it started the ball rolling and um, I got a book deal very quickly. I was really lucky. Uh, I got an incredible agent and, and she helped me shape the story. And at that stage, it was the difficulty was really figuring out which stories to tell because I uncovered so many. It turns out I had a family of 34 people um, before the war, a lot more now. Um, and they all had pretty incredible stories. So it was 2017 and that's when it became a book. But it's been going on you know, since 1970 in Caracas, really. So you say your father died in, in 2001. He was cremated, I think on September the 11th, 2001, yes. you were unable to go to, to that cremation because you were pregnant at, at the time. Quite a gap between his death, his passing, and, and when you actually embarked on the project. Did it, before we go into the nuts and bolts of the extraordinary story, did, did it sort of resolve something in you, the writing of the book? Oh, it resolved so many things. So I think 
I mean, I, I never really understood my father when he was alive. He was a very complex man. He was a really interesting, wonderful father to have, really exciting uh, in many ways. But, but you know, there was a, he, there was some parts of his personality which he just could not access. Um, so yes, absolutely. It also, you know, it, it, it gave me this family that I didn't know I have or I had, uh, certainly. And it, um, yeah, it shows you, I think if you look at where you come from and the remarkable things that the people before you were capable of, it sort of shows you in many ways what you're capable of too. Um, so yes, it gave me a huge, uh, I don't know, maybe completeness, a lot of peace, I think. And I finally felt, I always felt growing up in Venezuela, um, you know, sort of, going to a Catholic school, having a very traditional Venezuelan upbringing. Um, I, I always felt like I didn't really belong. And now finally, you know, much later in life, I, I really feel like I, I do belong. Um, so paint a picture for us, if you would, Ariana, of what childhood was like in Caracas. You're, you're, there are wonderful pictures in the book, including, as we've said, of your, your grandparents but also of your mother, who was stunningly beautiful, and your, your father, who was kind of ruggedly handsome as well, white-haired, a, a, a nose that was misshapen from, from boxing when he was younger. I'm not sure that the, the colour of his eyes quite come out, of course, because they're, they're black and white pictures, but he had very startling eyes, I think, didn't he? Mm -hmm. You described the, the childhood as one of colour and, and reds and oranges of, of birds of paradise and different dignitaries or business people, politicians passing in and out of your house. Your, and your father, who, who arrived in, in Venezuela in the late 40s, as you say, made an astonishing success of things. Your mother was from this very established family and together they, they combined to create quite a force in Venezuela. They did. So, I, I mean, we lived in a beautiful house in the center of Caracas. It had stunning gardens and it really was filled with color and with sounds. You had, well, I mean, you had every possible bird, you had every possible flower. It was, it was really stunning. And it, the house was always filled with people. Um, and, and as you say, sort of politicians, but there were also artists. So, um, and I've just, I had just been writing about this because I found a photograph of my father in our garden talking to Marcel Marceau, the mime. And this brought back a memory of when I was a little girl and I woke up one morning and I saw this remarkable, beautiful, elegant figure in our garden, just moving. I mean, he seemed like his, he didn't have any bones. He seemed like he was made of air and it was just stunningly beautiful. And I, of course, now remember it was Marcel Marceau and he was practicing, he was about to perform in a theater in Caracas and he was practicing his beep, which was this character that he created, his routine. Um, and it, it's sort of a remarkable story because we now know, I, I'm not sure he, my father knew at the time either, that Marcel Marceau was a Jew and that he was part of the resistance and that he helped rescue all these Jewish families. Uh, and and it, it's quite remarkable to have this photograph of my father and to sort of know that they were there, that they were together, and that they probably never ever spoke about their wars. Um, but, you know, so it was an incredible childhood, really. I was, it, it was amazing to have people like Marcel Marceau in my garden doing his beautiful mimes. And um, it's, it was filled with color and it was filled with, I suppose, you know, the prattle of success that, that, that you get. And yet there were, these moments which jarred with all that success and all that color. So my father was always engaged in the present and he was always excited by things and he had absolutely no reason to have any fears, you would think, to have nightmares. And he would wake up, I mean, I would wake up as a child a number of times because he would be screaming at the top of his lungs and my room was down the hallway from them and I could hear his screams in a different language. Um, and they were particularly marked one night when I had actually sort of, I had had a nightmare myself and I had gone to sleep with my parents. Um, and I remember that vividly, he was just covered in sweat. So it, there were little moments like that that really made no sense. Um, and you know, there was a reluctance about talking about family or about the past. He wasn't really someone that spoke about feelings, but the childhood was just bliss, absolute bliss. Um, 
you know, and Venezuela was very different then than it is now. It was a place filled with, with potential and it was booming investment. You know, the people were investing in it. It was a wonderful, vibrant arts community. Um, so it was really a fabulous place to grow up. In the house was full of extraordinary art, and very quite high profile art as, as well. Uh, nudes, and I, I think you describe in the book how the, the mother of one of your young friends shielded her, her daughter's gaze from this enormous nude with, with a woman with her legs spread apart, I think, by, by a blue balloon. And she was never to be seen in the house again, the little girl. So it was a, huge, it was a hugely artistic environment, wasn't it, when, when you were growing up? And I, I wonder on, on the detective front, because you mentioned that you, were, you had these detective skills, you set up this little detective club with your friends. I, I think inspired partly by Enid Blyton. And I just wonder whether you would have done that had you not had, and maybe you can't answer this question, but had you not had that sense of, of, of that there's something to look for in your father's past or in your father? Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to look back and say, okay, would I have done it? I think, I think we're shaped by what we're, you know, what we grew up with. And I think you're absolutely right. I think I, I always knew, I always sensed there was a mystery to my father. And I certainly didn't do this consciously. I mean, I now know, of course, that the biggest mystery I will probably ever solve was the mystery of my father, but I, I didn't then. But, but there, were, there were things that just didn't add up. And, and I think children often can't, are not eloquent enough to, to explain those things, but sense much more than, than well, than, 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 than they can explain. So I absolutely, I, I think there was something there. And of course, when I was, I set up this detective agency. I grew up, I had half brothers, but I grew up alone in this beautiful house. And um, one of the many ways of getting people to come in, especially as I had this very scary, very uh, sort of obscene art. And, and there was a lot of German expressionists and people, you know, little body parts all over the house. So it, was, it wasn't just that they were nude. A lot of them were mutilated. <laughs> so it was pretty scary if you were a child. So one of my ways of, of ensuring that I had friends was starting this detective club um, and making it exciting. Um, and I'm not sure it was really that exciting to spy on people, but because there were, there was lots going on in the house, there was always someone to spy on. And my father proved to be a remarkable person because he had all these little quirks. Um, and one of those afternoons, my cousin Rodrigo, um, who is um, who's now a boring lawyer, but he was a remarkable detective and very detail oriented, produced this report and said, your father had moved, has moved to this box and it's a box which must contain treasure because he moved it very, very carefully from this long room where, to which he only had keys, where he repaired his 297 watches. Um, so he had old pocket watches and he was obsessed with those. And he had moved this box from that room to this bookshelf in one of the living rooms that we used to call it the library because it was just filled with bookshelves. And it was that afternoon, I mean, I waited for everyone to go because it involved my father and I never really knew, you know, I think, uh, thinking about it now, I obviously knew there was something, I just didn't know what we were gonna find and it was my father. So it, I waited for everyone to go and then I went and I opened this box and I found, and I actually have it here, a little bit like your grandfather's soldier. Um, I, have, I have this ID card that I found and it absolutely terrified me. So I opened the box and then there, there you have my father without his broken nose, um, but he had these eyes and I, you know, by the time I came along, he was 50, he was very wrinkled. Um, but I recognized him. And what really jarred was the fact that there, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can see it sort of there, but the name is Jan Sylvester. And my father was called Hans Neumann. And, you know, his date of birth was a little off too. So there it says 11-3-1921. And it should have said 19-9-2-1921. So everything just didn't add up. And I was terrified. So I think that's when really I decided well, so the detective club really had to keep on going for and you, another. You through the house. Years. You charge through the house to find your mother to, to say that effectively that your father was a fraud. Yeah. I mean, you say it was, it was terrifying, but it must have thrown your world into total disarray. 
Well, it, it did. And I think it's actually quite telling that I didn't go, I mean, I think if my children found an ID card with my name on it or my their father's name on it that said someone else's name, they would, you know, they'd be pretty discombobulated. They'd come and say, hey, what the hell is this? But they, they'd be very casual about it. And I certainly don't think they would use the words that I used. I immediately went to my mother and I said, he's an imposter which is a strange term. And I guess it tells you, you know, I think there were, obviously I always knew there was something my father was, keep, was keeping secret. Um, and, and she was, my mother's always been incredibly comforting and wonderful. Um, she is to this day. And she just said, oh, please don't worry about it. It's completely fine. He had a difficult war, your father. And, um, you know, just don't worry about it. Don't ask any questions. He had to pretend to be someone else to survive. But, you know, it's better not to ask questions. It upsets him. And, and you know, kids, I think especially when you're an only child, you do what you're told. Um, especially if you're told that it's going to upset your father. Were you able to, to bury that, though? Or did that continue to live with you through your teens? You know, I think I, I think I buried it and that I certainly didn't bring it up consciously. Uh, but I think it always tinged my relationship with my father. I always felt there was something that he, I wouldn't say lie, that he was lying about, but I certainly that he was keeping from me. So I always felt, and, and this was particularly true when I was a teenager, there was, there was something there I couldn't trust. And I think that's pretty difficult when you're, you know, when it's your father that you cannot trust. So it was, there, it was always there. Start to tell us then the, the story of your father and, and his upbringing and what sort of a, a boy and, and young man he would become. Well, and, and you have to realize, of course, that I've just discovered all this now. So I feel like I've, I've you know, I had the father that I had, which was when he was 50 to, to when he died to had, uh, and he was 80. But I, I've now discovered this, this, this young man who was also my father, who doesn't you know, if you saw the two, and when I saw, first discovered all the letters and all the stories of this man, they called Handa or Handel, um, I thought it was actually someone else. So my father grew up in, um, he was born in 1921 in Prague. He had an older brother who had been born in 1918 called Lothar. He had um, a, a very sort of, I guess, middle-class upbringing in, in Prague. They were Jewish, but they were assimilated. There was my grandfather Otto, who was an engineer, and he was um, completely self-made, but very pedantic, very detail-focused. And he had started a paint factory with one of his brothers, um, who was called Richard. And then there was my grandmother Ella, and she was a complete opposite of my grandfather. She is was beautiful, and her life was about music and beauty and joy and the present. Um, my grandfather was dour and they had a pretty normal life. They lived in, had a, uh, they had an apartment um, in a building in Prague, just right next to the factory. My grandfather was very pragmatic. He wanted to, you know, w walk within three minutes of where he worked or, or live within three minutes of where he worked. And then my grandmother eventually convinced him to buy um, a house by the river about 45 minutes an hour in those days, probably away from Prague. And, um, and that's where they spent most of their time as a family and certainly most of their happy time. And I have all these photographs in their lives in the sort of 20s and 30s, and they seem a completely normal family. Of course, I know through their letters, and of course, we all know through history that it, life was becoming increasingly more fraught and, and dangerous if you were, if you were Jewish. Um, so, or, you know, by 1933, 1934, the tone of the letter starts to change. And of course, in 1939, the Nazis march into Prague and, and their entire life changes. So my, everyone but my grandfather, for example, was baptized in an attempt um, to somehow evade what this noose that was tightening around all of them. And of course, I mean, many Jews did this. and was it was to no avail because what you chose as your religion had no bearing at all on anything it was the religion of your ancestors that mattered your grandfather i think i'm right in saying otto would use black shoe polish 
to disguise the colour of his hair because otherwise he would have been seen as useless and therefore discardable. That's right. So in 1942, my, my grandmother gets deported first in 1942. Um, she goes to Theresienstadt in May. And my father and my grandfather and my uncle Lothar, um, who was saved throughout the, until 1945 because he was married to this beautiful woman who, uh, who was Aryan or who was a Gentile rather, um, they, um, they start a system of contraband so that they could sneak things to my grandmother in the camp. And eventually my grandfather is deported too in November 42. And, um, and then it's just my father who's outside, my father and Lothar, and they start putting all these parcels. And because they, you know, they, they knew that the Nazis needed people to be fit and to work. Because if you were productive, they would keep you alive. And if you weren't productive, um, they didn't necessarily know what would happen to them, but they knew people were shipped east to Auschwitz. So it was key for my grandfather who had been told all his life that he, you know, his family was very distinguished because they all had white hair by the time they were 30, 35. He was in his um, late um, 40s, early 50s during the war. And of course his hair was completely white. So one of the things that they snuck, that my father and Lothar snuck into these parcels was hair dye, which of course eventually became shoe polish so that he could dye his hair and appear younger. And I think, you know, that bought him a few years of life in Theresienstadt. Tell us about Stenka, because Stenka was the, the wife of Lothar. So he, he, she was your aunt. She was your, the sister-in-law of your, of your father. And, and she wasn't Jewish, but she exhibited extraordinary bravery, didn't she, in trying to get into the, into the camp, into Theresienstadt, to see Ella. She, and, and she is, to me, she's the hero of the book because my family did what they had to do to survive. But she, she didn't have to do any of this. I mean, she was beautiful and educated. She was studying law. She drove her own car. She was independently wealthy. Um, she had absolutely no need to marry Lothar, my uncle, who, you know, was Jewish. Um, and, but she did twice, actually. She married him in, in 1940 and then had to divorce him to sort of, um, because of Nazi laws and then actually managed to remarry him again, much to her family's own horror, because of course this was just a crazy thing to do. But as if that wasn't crazy enough, she, as the news started tightening and restrictions on Jew, Jews to move around were more stringent, the family couldn't, and, and of course they couldn't work, the family had no money, so she would take food to them and she would deliver medicine and parcels. Uh, again, this was forbidden. But what she what was really insane is when Ella first goes, so Ella goes to Theresienstadt in May 1942, she was actually destined to go to Sobibor and completely by luck she, she fainted and that saved her life because she stayed in Theresienstadt and that, that train to Sobibor, everyone was shot on arrival. So um, Ella, but the family didn't know where Ella was until I think August 1942. And when they find out Stenka, who um, adored Ella, decides that the obvious thing to do is to sneak into Theresienstadt. Um, so it shows you what kind of person she was, how bold and, and, and daring and, and, and generous and wonderful she was, because she actually sneaks into the camp to find my grandmother. So she waits, and, and if, you, if you go to Theresienstadt, it's, it's not a camp like you would imagine Auschwitz to be. It's more of a sort of ghetto. It's a fortified town. And there are, quite, there are a lot of entrances, and, um, and the entrances were policed. But the people from the camp would go out into the fields to work in the fields. And that is exactly when Stenka, dressed as someone that would have been in the camp with a yellow star sewn on her, um, on, on her chest basically meets up with the workers and sneaks into the camp when they go in for lunch, finds my grandmother, finds her barracks, and then brings her, I think, a shawl and a, a, a few little tidbits and actually more than anything brings her love and, 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 and positivity and hope. And I have not only Stenka's account, which is pretty remarkable, but I have a letter from my grandmother to the family, which is snuck out saying, you know, I had been really depressed and the first months here were really horrendous. But thank goodness, Stenka 
came in and she, you know, we just looked into each other's eyes and held each other's hands and she brought me so much hope. And I now believe that you are going to be reunited again. So the Stenka is, is incredible because she is, in addition to being the glue and providing, you know, material stuff like food and, and resources, she also is the bringer of joy and the bringer of hope, which is so key. Of course, if you read Frankel or you read, you know, it, if you're going to survive, you're, it, it's not just about, you know, food and, 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 and disease. It's also about what you're, you know, whether you're hopeful and you're positive and that is, you know, at least half the battle. So she does that and then she does it again. So she sneaks into the camp again in 1944. So the couriers, you know, depending obviously on restrictions and, and rumors, um, the couriers sometimes were too scared to do, to take the parcels in. And Stenka was very worried about um, Otto because he was running out of hair dye shoe polish. And she sneaks in in 1944 again to bring it to him. So she's, she's, oh, she's incredible. And uh -huh. I have her, you know, her daughter is incredible too. She's now become a friend and um, it's all, you know, it's, it's sort of beautiful. I mean, it's incredibly beautiful, particularly because I grew up not knowing anything. I mean, I didn't know I had an aunt called Stenka to begin with. It's hugely inspiring. I think we need these stories, perhaps more than ever, at a time of global crisis that we're experiencing at the moment. I think Alif Shafak, someone else I'm interviewing for the Harrogate Festival, she, she talks about the power of, of storytelling that we need in these turbulent times, and, and perhaps not just turbulent because of the pandemic. We need story, storytellers to tell their stories. We need them to tell their stories as we're going through it, not just looking back. I, I don't know whether you heard, I didn't want to interrupt that, that strand of the story, but that the postman just delivered the, the mail. And it's so surreal, isn't it? Because in normal times, we would be on stage together in Harrogate, as you said earlier, and probably go to Betty's afterwards for, for a piece of cake. But now we're in our homes with the postman interrupting, <laughs> doing, his, doing his amazing job, but inter interrupting our conversation that would otherwise, as I say, you know, have a, a, an audience. It's just so, it's so surreal. I, I, I want to ask you, by the way, just to, just to pause, before we go back to your father, about how you found lockdown and how you found, found it as a writer and whether you're able to continue to be creative, whether, whether your thoughts and ideas and words flow as they, as they had before. So it's, it, it's changed. Um, my, my first month of lockdown was, um, was incredibly difficult because I'm, my mother is in New York and my stepfather is 91 and they both got COVID. Um, and of course, we knew very little about it then. Um, this was actually my, it was a, the big, you know, it was April actually when they both got ill. My mother wasn't that ill, but you, you know, as, as someone, you know, you obviously want to be close to the people that you love, especially when they're having a difficult time. Um, so it was, I have to say April for me in terms of any creativity whatsoever was a complete write off. Um, and I think then also May, because I was, just recovering from all the stress uh, of April. And, and, and I'm incredibly lucky that, um, and they're incredibly lucky that they had it mildly and that my stepfather after being very, very ill for six weeks um, made it through. Um, aside from, so I, I think I, you know, I, I found, I mean, it's, it's very strange. It's I, on the one hand, I feel like, I feel like it's May now, I can't believe we're almost in October. I mean, it just seems, it just seems ridiculous, right? So time has acquired this amorphous sort of, it's, it's no, no longer linear, it seems. It's sort of every day passes by incredibly slowly and yet the months seem to be rushing ahead. Um, so I, I, and I, and I find it very variable. I'm a control freak. I'm a bit like my grandfather. I, I need to sort of, I focus on the detail and I need to know what I'm doing. And of course, you know, you, one doesn't. Um, my, my son was meant to start university in Chicago in America and it turns out actually that he started instead in Paris, same university, but you know, so I've just come back from taking him to Paris and I'm now isolating for two weeks, quarantining. Um, so um, I'm, you know, I think, I think one has to keep one's routines. I think you have to let go of control, um, which is a very important thing to do. Um, and very how, difficult. How do you let go of control at the same time as maintaining routine? 
Well, I think, I think you realize that there are bigger things that you can't control and you focus, at least I do, because I'm a control freak. I like to focus on the little ones. So, you know, if, if I, if I set up a routine of things that I can do, such as, you know, go on zoom and do a yoga class, I know I can do that no matter what happens. Um, so you, you focus on these little things and I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of research for a second book. And again, that's something I can control and something that allows me to escape from the news, not only about COVID, but also about politics um, and, and, our, and our leaders, or, or, or if you can call them leaders. Um, so it's, you know, I, I, it's about sort of plunging into things that you can, that, that bring you joy, um, that certainly give you your life meaning. And, and trying to sort of just block out the ones that, that are upsetting or distracting and, 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 you know, so it's about, it's about, I don't know what it is. It's you, you sort of re reconfigure what it is that brings you joy and you try to, you know, I don't know. It, it, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, I, I'm now in touch with all these people that I went to university with that I hadn't spoken for 30 years. So in many ways, there's, there's lots of little, Lots. I wouldn't say lots, but there are certain certain silver linings um, to the pandemic. So we adapt, don't we, as human beings, mm -hmm. very successfully in many ways. And what, one of the things that is striking in the book, of course, is is the way in which your your father managed to adapt. I mean, in a way, that's the heart of the story. So let's let's go back to him. So he's in Prague, and he's he's got a friend who plays an important role, Zdenek, who who helps him in in, in a crucial way. So. Just tell us how he managed to survive while in Prague and how it was then remarkably as a Jew in the war, he managed to end up hiding in, in plain sight in Berlin. So um, my father managed to escape being transported three times. The first and second time when his mother and his father were sent, he was saved at the, actually the second time at the very last minute from the actual train station. And the third time when the notice arrived in March um, 1943, he, he knew there was no escaping it. So he decided with the help of his brother Lotter and with the help of the paint factory manager, who was this wonderful man called Mr. Novak. And Mr. Novak's daughters, um, who I met in Prague a couple of years ago, still remember the fights. One of them was alive during the war and she remembers the fights between her mother and her father. Um, because they thought it was a huge risk for Mr. Novak to be taking. Um, and what Mr. Novak did is he built a fake wall in the factory in a little room. They put paint canisters on top of it or large barrels on, uh, not on top, in front of the, of the wall to make it look a bit more, seem a little more real. And behind that wall, with a tiny little window, which was very low, and again, the paint factory is still there, so I, I had quite incredibly could go and visit it and could see the little window which where he would have had access to outside um, in the evenings. But my father was hidden for two months in a working factory in Prague. So about 50 employees would go in and work. Um, they'd go in around eight in the morning. So my father had to be completely quiet until six o'clock, then they went. And Mr. Novak would stay behind and, and, and help him and ensure that he had food. And that's what he did from March to May. At some stage in April, his best friend Stenik, so they were in um, chemistry school together, which makes them sound very serious, and they really weren't. Um, I think they were quite bright. They were pranksters, that's what they wanted to do. They were pranksters and poets and, and chaste girls, um, as you would expect normal 18 year olds, I suppose, to do. Um, but the war obviously put an end to that. and. It meant Stenek, who wasn't Jewish, was sent um, to work as part of the war effort in Berlin. And he, it, he's allowed to come back home to Prague. He visits his best friend who's hiding in the factory one evening and over some slivovits and, um, I, and, and actually I presume now that I know the story with the light uh, of a candle and actually Stenek talks about a candle in his memoirs too. Um, Stenek says to my father, oh, Hans, we're so overworked in Berlin. And ironically, they're overworked in Berlin because all these Jews who had been forced laborers in the factory had just been sent to camps. And he says, 
if only you could come and help me. And there's a Czech saying, which goes something like this, the darkest shadow is just beneath the candle. So if you're going to hide anywhere, you don't hide where in the periphery where the light is going to give you away. No, no, you go to the center of it all, you hide in the darkest spot that you can think of, which is just underneath in the center, just underneath the candle. So that's what my father did. So he said, absolutely, that's absolutely what I'm gonna do, Stenik, you're absolutely right, I'm gonna go and help you. I'm going to go and hide in plain sight in Berlin. If you need, you know, if the factory needs men, they're going to hire me. I'm going to go and, and basically bluff my way into a job in Berlin. And that's what he does. So Stenek lends him his passport, which is, a, again, a huge act of bravery and generosity. Um, my father's girlfriend at the time, Mila, um, pretends she lost her ID, so they doctor her ID, change the photograph, change, you know, work in inks. Obviously, they were, they could do it with, with you, know, you know, you could, you could buy all these things in the black market. Um, so they doctor the ID card, and my father crosses on May the 3rd, 1943, crosses into Berlin with an ID card in his name, or rather this created name, Jan Sebesta, a passport in a different name, which is the name of his best friend, Stenik Tuma, who he looked nothing like at all. If you look in the book, there's a, there's a photograph and you can see there, I mean, they really don't look like one another. And, um, and, and he manages to bluff his way, convince Dr. Hogan, who is Stenik's boss at the factory, to hire him. Pretends that, you know, I should have been working in the fields, uh, but I'm, you know, I'm too, I think he says I'm too bright to be working in the fields and, you know, I really could be very useful to you and, and convinces Mr. Um, Dr. Hogan that he needs to give this man a job. Uh, so Dr. Hogan, who is an ardent Nazi, ends up actually helping my father, not knowing that he was a Jew, to find a work permit and to find a room to rent in, in Berlin where he lives for two years working in this factory and, um, and being a firefighter and, and lives, leads the most extraordinary life for, for anyone, let alone a Jew from Prague. But there aren't really adjectives, uh, there aren't sufficient adjectives, I think, to, to deploy here for, for that journey that he made. And for me, it, it sort of brings in two things. One, just how high the stakes were that he should take that risk how terrified he must have been, mm. and also how incredibly brave he was and how much chutzpah he had. And what you don't mention there in, in the retelling is that when he was on the train into Germany, uh, he, he had cyanide, didn't he? He had a little vial of cyanide. Did he, did, he, did he keep it actually in his mouth as the guard came down the train in case the guard should reveal him or he should be revealed? He did, and, it, and it, it's, I mean, it, it, it's a... a tiny little vial of cyanide that he kept in his um in his pocket and i think he kept it in his pocket throughout the war um and for that crossing in berlin he actually taught he, he wrote these sort of retrospective memoirs which i'm very lucky to have in 1991 and 1992 and he mentions i mean he 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 has a whole anecdote of of retelling of his crossing and he says specifically i grab the vial of cyanide take it from my pocket put it at the back of my mouth because he's absolutely terrified and laws are constantly changing it's part of the it's part of the mechanism to control everyone right they keep you on your feet by changing laws all the time so he doesn't know if they're going to ask for the id card or the passport or both but if they ask for both he's you know that's it so then he would obviously bite into the vial of cyanide because he feared that what would happen to him would be worse. Um, and he keeps it throughout the war. So I think there's quite a lot of episodes actually um, between 43 and 45, as you would expect, where he came pretty close to biting that capsule. So um, well, I feel very lucky that he didn't, obviously. But yes, that, that capsule of cyanide. Um, and I think again, my uncle Lotter, who was um, also had a capsule of cyanide that, again, you could buy on the black market. Um, just, just tell us how he felt about surviving by helping the arch enemy. Uh, um, you know, I, I don't know. It's one of the questions I wish I could ask him. He, um, 
there was obviously a huge conflict. I don't think his work helped it really. I mean, I think he was a pretty small player in this factory, which was producing lacquers for the Luftwaffe during the war. Um, he has an opportunity where there is a man who he calls a Dutch student and, um, and the Dutch student comes to him in, in the dining room in, in the factory and says, um, you should, and you should, we should meet outside and then convinces him to pass off some of the documents that he's um, managed to have access to. Because one of the things that he does, which, you know, it's, it's all about reinventing yourself in these situations, right? So he goes from being a prankster and not studying at all to being a very serious worker at this factory who ingratiates himself with Dr. Hogan, who then promotes him very quickly um, and gives him access to files that he can then pass off to this Dutch student. And interestingly, because, you know, you write these books and they do acquire a life of their own afterwards. Someone actually just got in touch with me and said, I know, I know the identity of the Dutch student and he wasn't Dutch at all. He, he was an English spy. Um, so it's not, it's not something that, that I go into a lot in the book because I, what I tried to do, even though it's not a history book, is I tried to ensure that every story I told had at least two different sources. And the story of the Dutch student, I only had my father's source um, at the time because he was the only one that talked about it. Um, so anyways, um, so I think he tried to atone for it by doing that. Again, I, I have no idea. Maybe I'll find out if, if anything that he passed on ever made it anywhere that where it could have been useful. Um, but I think he felt a little bit better. I think also when he's a firefighter, he has these moments because he's volunteered. So even though he wasn't he, he he wasn't people didn't know he was a Jew they knew he was Czech and Czechs were not allowed to have relationships with Germans and he has a relationship him and Zdenek both get German girlfriends and they are punished by Dr. Hogan by being volunteered as firefighters and my father has this you know conflict because he thinks okay well if I go and help you know, do I fan the flame, flames or do I put them out? Because I want, you know, the truth is I want the war to end as quickly as possible. Um, so on the one hand, he's meant to be rescuing these people that are being, you know, bombed. And Berlin is literally, I mean, being decimated at night and, and day and night. And, and my father, while everyone rushes down to the shelters, is rushing up to help the victims and to put out the fires. So, um, so I have, I, you know, I have no idea how he felt. Obviously, I wish I wish I could ask him, but it must have been, I mean, a horrendous conflict to have. And uh, yet, just uh, describe to us as well, Ariana, how he then makes it out of Germany, and eventually makes it in 1949, as you said at the beginning, to Venezuela. Just briefly, because we don't have much more time. So he, he survives the war. Um, he's actually injured um, in an accident at the plant in um, very early 1945. He manages in April to cross back to, um, to Prague. He convinces someone in, in, in one of the ministries to give him a permit. By, you know, by then, I think it was obvious that the, the, the war had been lost. And he basically says, listen, if you give me a permit, I will remember you. And I will say, when you're accused of, you know, of, of doing horrible things, I will say that you didn't do horrible things. And I will also remember you if you don't give me the permit. And I will, you know, I will be there when you are tried. Um, and this poor man in Berlin actually says, whatever, and gives him a permit to travel back to Prague. He goes back. Um, he then finds out what happens to his family. He ends up marrying Mila, who was the wonderful woman who gave him her ID card and who helped him during the war. And um, they managed with Lotte, um, who had also survived the war, to reclaim the paint factory. And they start to, they try to restart life again. Um, and they don't succeed, then the communists march in. And I think that's, they sort of say, okay, time, time to go. And they had tried to emigrate before the war. So they had done quite a little bit of homework beforehand. And Venezuela was open to immigrants, which wasn't the case for 
at America and a lot of other places. So off to Venezuela they went. And, and just make clear to everyone, how you pieced all this together, because you had the box that, that, re, that resurfaced, that you believe your, that your, well, that your father left you, didn't he, as a, as a sort of message, and it's essentially to say, look, you'll be interested in this. But whether or not he intended you to tell the story to the world, I suppose we don't know, but you took it, I think, as a sign that he did. And then you had the memoir from the, the early 1990s that he wrote. Where, when, when and where did they emerge? And then this, uh, this other box that, that arrived that, that was indispensable. So the first box, um, which had the ID card when my father died, also had the memoirs that he had written. So he had left it for me. And he had thrown every, all the other papers away. So it was quite telling, at least to me, that he had saved this and left it all in, in one little box for me. And it was all about his time in Berlin. Then there were another three boxes that arrived that I was incredibly lucky to have, including the letters from my grandparents in Theresienstadt, but uh, one from Prague and one from California that arrived with more letters. Um, and I, I, you know, it took me about 10 years to trace all these people. So I, I, I it created a family tree. I started, I traced people in Indonesia, in Australia, in California, in Paris, in the Czech Republic. Um, and and spoke to as many of them as I could and pieced it all or most of it together. And, um, and just going back to the importance of telling stories, just very briefly, I think it's, I think it's so key that when we look at history, we tell, we humanize it because you, you know, people throw these numbers at you and they don't mean anything really. I mean, at least maybe because I'm not very numeric and, and I always forget numbers. They don't mean anything to me, but if you hear a story, then you remember it. And I think as you know, we all transmit our lessons through stories to others. And I think it's, you know, if we're going to get anywhere and learn anything, we need to tell these, these stories, the story of your grandfather, the story of, of my grandparents and, and humanize it. So that people see what, well, the beauty and, 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 and the damage that we can do to other humans. Yeah, I, I remember watching the film Life is Beautiful. I think I watched it in Chile and it had Spanish subtitles and was in the original Italian. So I, I, I didn't really know what was going on for a while. I just knew it was utterly beautiful. And I remember speaking to someone in the years afterwards who said that he didn't think, he felt very strongly, the son actually of, of Holocaust survivors or, or Nazi era survivors, he didn't feel that the Holocaust should or could be reduced to individual stories. And, and I respect his viewpoint because the horror of it was so, was so beyond our comprehension that you know, I, I, I understand in a way where he's coming from. But I have to say, I think I side with you on this, that the way that we, we keep those horrors alive is, is to tell the stories and, and also to remember, as you do, the bravery and the hope and the, the optimism that went hand in hand with the horror. You know, if, if you think, if, 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 yes, we have to be careful if, if we aren't ourselves involved and, and we have to get the tone right, of course. But it's important to remember that I'm sure humour and music and joy were all employed, deployed by people who were suffering the most terrible indignities in the camps to keep them going. But, but the way in which, just for example, Zenka infuses Ella with, with hope and, and, and with sort of a, a, a will to go forward is an example of that. Well, it transports you, right? It elevates you. It makes you, it gets you out of the miserable surroundings. And it, you know, I, I just think people can imprison minds, uh, sorry, bodies, but they cannot imprison minds. And your mind is free to be moved by, by, by beauty, by music, by whatever, whatever it is that, that transports you and that makes you, makes you better. And it's, you know, it, whether it's art or whether it's, you know, people doing the right thing, um, there is actually beauty everywhere. And it's, and it's important, I think, when we're in difficult situations to, to remember that and to, and to focus on that. And well, I, I think mean, we're, we're looking for beauty, aren't we now, in, in the pandemic? I mean, at the height of lockdown earlier in the year, we may be heading towards that again, who knows? We had to, to, to really appreciate our, our one hour or whatever it was outside and to, to see beauty on, on our doorstep, even sometimes from our windows, to listen to the, 
the birds, just for example. The other thing I think is, is that storytelling perhaps encourages others to tell stories as, as well. It can become some sort of virtu virtuous chain. I, I showed you earlier my, my little soldier. So he was from my grandfather on my mother's side. And he, ended, he started the war as a private in the British Army and ended up as a major and won a Field Marshal Montgomery's aide to camp. And he won the military cross, I think, for going behind enemy lines. He was involved in, in the D-Day landings and so forth. On my, on my other side of the family, as I've told you before, on my father's side, my, my grandparents were Jewish refugees. My grandfather, technically a refugee, and my grandmother, in effect, a refugee. And funny enough, she, because you mentioned that your father was studying chemistry, so my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, was a chemistry student in Vienna and on one, before the war. And on one occasion, she asked one of the other students to pass a, a, the test tube to her so that she could take her turn or whatever. And he said, not for you. In other words, not for you, you Jew. And her, her father sort of saw what was coming and got the, got the family out. And my grandmother went to Cambridge and she studied under Wittgenstein. And then she has this whole remarkable story of her own that, that goes on. My grandfather was a concert pianist and he was, he was traveling in Ireland performing. And he was returning to Austria via Holland. And he chatted up a, a young woman on, on, on deck, caught a cold. And I think overnighted in Amsterdam, and that was the night when the, the Nazis marched into into Austria and into Vienna in the Anschluss. So he just he didn't go back, and he managed. And it's also an incredible story of its own. He managed to get his sister and his mother smuggled out. My 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 great great uncle, on the other hand, was not so fortunate. And he was, I think, the, the pre-Nazi advisor to the Chancellor of Austria and he was the first or amongst the first to be arrested, put under house arrest by the Gestapo. Mm -hmm. And he was a paraplegic, he, he, he didn't have any legs and so he, he, he chose to carry cyanide in his ring should he ever be caught in a house fire. And he took the cyanide, managed to persuade the guards to leave the room, took the cyanide and lost his life. So it's an, the, your book and, and the stories that it tell and the, the remarkable tales of survival were very they're obviously very close to me, but they're also close to anyone who's a human being because just, just as we might fear that, that or wonder how we would behave in extreme situations, so I think it's, what, it's brilliant to be able to see people who, who, who acted like Stenka did with such bravery and such optimism. And who did actually, at the end of the day, the only thing to do, which was the right thing to do. Right, I mean, and to believe in to believe in in in, in goodness, and to believe in, in in love, I you know, rather than than do nothing, which would have been the easy, easier thing to do. So no, absolutely, and I think, I mean, I I, I think we are our stories. I mean, I, I hear you tell your stories, and and and, I mean, it must be, they must be a part of who you are, right? And I think often we we are surrounded by these remarkable people, um, and seldom do we ask for their own stories. I, I had to interview someone the other day who lives two blocks away from where my kids go to school in Hammersmith and I walk that street all the time because it's actually very good for parking when I have to go to parents' PTA meetings. And I, I, I found her the other day, she's a 98 year old woman. She survived Ravensbrook and um, she was a resistance fighter in Holland and she just lives there and you know, she's, um, I must have walked past her. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you that I have, but I must have walked past her a number of times. I really walked past her house. And it, you know, you just need to ask people to tell their stories because we can all learn from others. And, and, and we all, you know, our parents all have remarkable stories and we see them as these, ugh, our parents and, and never really bother to ask the questions until, well, until often it's too late. And so just to, to end almost where we started in, in, in what it's done for you, as, as the teller of this story, the teller of, in, in many ways, your own story, how, how do you feel about it now that it's been released into the world and that so many people have been able to share it? Well, I'm, I'm you know, it's shown me who I am in, in more ways than one, not only because it showed me my roots, but it's also shown me, you know, I always wanted to be a detective and I always wanted to be a writer. And, um, and I was always a detective, albeit a private, uh, literally in my own life detective and for my friends. Um, and, and, and again, I wrote this therapy, so it's rather than for the public. And I now, um, 
I think what emboldened me to 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 write was that I realized actually that what was important was not so much the writing as the telling of the story. Um, so it's I mean it's made me it's made me complete and and it's inspired me to be I mean it's shown me what we're capable of um, not just people in my family who are trying to survive but people like Mr Novak or Stenek or Stenka um, and 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 I find that really inspirational so I I now have these little heroes in my life that that you know are part of the reason I'm here. Uh, just one final question for me in my sort of detective work as an interviewer. It's interesting to me that you're that you were the the daughter of a of an immigrant, mm -hmm. and and you chose yourself to to migrate to another country to the other side of the world. Is that just a coincidence, or do you think that that something inside you was open to 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 difference and to change and to relocation? I, I think there was definitely. I mean, I think if you grow up the child of someone who's who's who was actually who was more than a migrant, who was a refugee, my father. Um, I, I think you realize that actually it's, it's the world that's your home, it's not your country, um, if that makes any sense. And I, I, I'm often, I often find it very frustrating how history, for example, is taught alongside country lines. So, you, you know, you, you study British history, you study American history, or you study German history, but it's, it's all our histories, actually. And, and sometimes stories that don't quite fit the mold get lost if that makes any sense but i think i think you do as, as i think you realize that you know you might you you might have to go and make your life elsewhere wherever it is that you're welcome wherever it is that you feel safe and venezuela for reasons which have obviously nothing to do with um with me has has become a place that is unsafe um and a place i didn't really feel i i belonged in anymore um so luckily i had i had the example of my father um, who had migrated before and knew that that was, that, you know, one can reinvent oneself. And I'm, I'm working on being properly British, whatever that means. But, um, but I definitely like the, the, the tea cakes <laughs> and, and, and fully, you know, I actually now have a British passport. So I'm very proud to be well, a part of this. We're very lucky to have you, Ariana, and the world's very lucky to have you as, as a writer. It's a wonderful book. And although we talk quite a lot of the details of it, the beauty of it, in a way, is in, in, in the telling and how it reads off, off the page and the way you write it. So I really do recommend people to go and get a copy if you haven't already. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been, it's been great fun. Thank you. It's been lovely to be here and it's lovely to chat to you again, Matt. Thank you very, very much. And you owe me a tea cake. <laughs> I, owe you, <laughs> I owe you a tea cake, exactly. We'll have to do the real Harrogate experience in the future. Exactly. Do you think it's just scones or do you think we can get sort of... Oh, no. I mean, there's, there are endless varieties of Good. ways to spoil, <laughs> spoil ourselves. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. That was really wonderful. Thank you so much.